Hello, Jose. Hello, Maria. Hi. Hello, Ceci. Hello, Ceci. Okay, so uh, we're all here and it's time to start our webinar. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. And thank you all for joining our webinar today on this hot topic. I'm Yasser Siud, your host, the managing partner for North Lead Canada Executive Search and Talent Management. North Lead stepped up and launched this series of panel led webinars in April 2021. We believe it is more important than ever now and as members of AIMS International and firm believers in leading by example to help our clients and prospects by listening and discussing these unprecedented challenges affecting you leaders more than most through our global team of experts we are here to empower you through these exceptional times so actually this webinar is not at all about us but it is meant to inspire our clients and prospects to find practical solutions to their existing talent challenges. Our leadership development experts are available from over 50 international markets and diverse sectors to listen, understand, design, and implement customized best practices to scale up your business. So today, we are delighted to see more than 200 leaders joining us from 17 different geographical markets and more than 12 industries we are really excited to have you with us today, and we're looking forward to continuing our conversation with all of you. So now I would like to introduce my colleague, Cecilia Diaz, board member and executive vice president for the Americas at Ames International to present the Ames International Network and Services. Thank you, Cecilia, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jasser, and thank you everybody and welcome. Uh, very quickly, just to share with you, Ames International is a global firm on executive search and leadership development consultancy. As Jasser mentioned, with a wide local knowledge potentialized with the active presence in more than 50 countries around the world. Our passion is reflected in the excellence of our personalized services our attention to our clients, candidates, and collaborators, as well as the fulfillment of our commitments, always with the objective of establishing a long-term relationship that contributes to the success of each of our clients. So we are so happy to have this journey with you today. Thank you so much, Cecilia, and thank you for your kind introduction of Ames International, and actually for joining us today, despite of your unbelievable agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jasser. It's a pleasure. I will now introduce our two panelists. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the fact that at any time during this event, you can just drop your email in the chat uh, to book a 30 minute complimentary leadership advisory session with one of our experts. Your email will only be seen, your email address will only be seen by our internal team. So our team will then contact you to arrange a mutually convenient time. And after our speakers are done, we will have an optional 10 minute Q&A session for our registrants interested in interacting with them. So you can send your questions anonymously in writing anytime during the presentation and throughout uh, through the chat. Uh, today, we are delighted to host Maria and Nolan. Uh, both are subject matter experts in their field but above all, they are action takers. Our first speaker is Maria Shishkova, Edel Carnegie Certified Local Training Director, the Head of Talent Management at Ames International, and is trained in specialized coaching at the Corporate Coach University of Dallas and Applied Economics at the University of Delaware. Maria is also SHL Hogan SSU and ULX Certified and her main expertise is in leadership training, coaching, general assessment, management consulting, and development centers. Thank you so much, Maria, for being with us today. And our second panelist is Nolan Bays. Nolan is the CEO of Circle. He is a PhD biochemist, neuroscientist, an entrepreneur, and innovation advisor. 
Nolan studied the cellular mechanisms of cell division within the brain and was able to build wearable technology that measures brain improvement. We are really delighted to have you with us today, Nolan. So after presenting our two panelists, I would like now to invite Maria to share with us her views on the roadmap to a sustainable talent management ecosystem. Maria, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Yasser. I can't help but remember a thought by Nassim Taleb. He is the famous author of The Black Swan, who said, asking science to explain life and vital matters is uh, equivalent to asking a grammarian to explain poetry. Well, I'll be speaking today from a purely pragmatic point of view of a practitioner. And luckily, we have Nolan, who's not only a scientist, but also an entrepreneur. So you're not going to be the grammarian explaining poetry, I believe, Nolan. And we definitely need to study and evaluate what's going on in the world right now, because it is said that we do live in unprecedented times times that have never happened like this in human history before. We all know, and we all expected actually, that the uh, speed of change is going to grow exponentially. We knew from history and experience that we people don't change as quickly as technology. So here we are today in a VUCA world. And I believe that all of us are aware with the VUCA abbreviation standing for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I'm not going to go on and on and on about that because it is uh, not any um, a big piece of news for you. Um, perhaps we even know that the world is classified not only as VUCA, but also as BANI. BANI standing for brittle and anxious and nonlinear and basically non-understandable. So why, why brittle? Because systems that we believe are very stable, all of a sudden they crash. Um, why anxious? Because we live in an information overflow. And this information, instead of making us uh, feeling more safe and secure and knowledgeable, etc. It only drives us crazy and leads to events like Brexit or fake news or information overflow. And we have to handle this and we have to continue working and living with the people we work and live with. Nonlinear, simply because the good old logic somehow doesn't seem to work that well as it used to work for so many centuries and even millennia. And the cause and effect relationships have seemed to be broken um, and incomprehensible because all this put together is creating a whole new reality, which may make some people feel really at a loss. So uh, is everything that bad? <laughs> and is everything lost, the good old times? Some of us may look at uh, what's going on with a little bit of, you know, sadness because uh, the environment looks uh, barren and dry, but others like entrepreneurs like Nolan may see opportunities and may see possibilities for innovation and change. So in situations like that, I'd like to think, you know what, despite how difficult it is, there is a gift somewhere. So my goal is like the goal of an Easter bunny, finding the gift. So where is the gift in this situation? Well, one of the gifts is that according to a recent Gartner study, the focus on leadership is increasing a lot. And um, the focus on understanding people and organizations and change and the future of work are becoming in focus. So now we'll speak more about talent management, the different areas of talent management, and we'll focus on, on lessons learned and on experiences, what works and what didn't work so that we know better next time. And talking about talent management, 
you know, I've, I've given quite a lot of time to, to really deeply understand what is that most people understand when they say talent management. So basically, it boils down to several, actually four important areas. Um, one of them is hiring people. The other one is managing processes, then developing people and organization and creating the support ecosystem that will make the whole system flexible and, and agile and able to, to thrive and survive in those unprecedented times. Obviously, taking into account the strategic direction and the goals and the plans and uh, the strategies that the organization would like to uh, take into place. So we'll start counterclockwise, um, not with hiring, although logically hiring seems to be coming first, but nowadays uh, our environment calls for a culture that would create the support system which would make possible what seemed to be impossible before. Take, for example, remote work, which to many organizations was mm, a kind of utopia. But nowadays, it's no news anymore. So with the support here, um, we, we have a few lessons from, um, from clients, from our experience with clients. One of them is that the usual logic is be careful, um, do a pilot and then scale. Um, and usually when we have good ideas, we tended to, to um, proofread them several times till we scale them up. However, we, um, we are currently in a project with a client who, uh, who called us with, um, with a request to start for them a short two session training on online communication. And when we continued the conversation and went a bit deeper into the conversation, it turned out that they actually do not need this specific training. They need something totally different. They, they need support for their people to, um, uh, to, to be able to, to relate to clients even in the online environment. And they needed support for enhancing their sales skills. So we started with a, uh, with a whole different proposal. And this conversation was only with the representative of the company in Germany. However, they liked the idea so much that we finally ended up having it not only in Germany, but simultaneously in Germany, Spain, and France. So with a little help from my friends, just like Beatles used to sing, um, we, we managed to scale up. So one of the messages is uh, let's, let's think bigger and broader and see how we can scale up quicker so that um, we can uh, you know, win this race with time. Another experience with scaling up is uh, from another client. Uh, they... Um, uh, they're, they're growing dramatically. It's an organization which at present have 15,000 employees in um, 12 different countries. And they started uh, from Europe. So their idea of scaling up is copy pasting what worked in their home country. And when we met with uh, their L&D people from the headquarters, one of the things they shared was that you know what, uh, we're a little bit surprised that some of the practices that were working so well here are not working that well in different countries. So when scaling up um, our messages, take into account the culture, the local culture, and don't try to replicate everything that is working well in your country, because what you will end up with is just mimicry. Well, I believe we have all seen those pictures of senior leaders of organizations that look exactly the same as, as if they're coming from, you know, a pipeline producing one and the same type of, uh, of people. Um, and if we, if we work like this, if we're replicating models that are specific only to a certain country or region, um, this will, this will produce limited results and in the mid to long term, perhaps negative results. But then talking about mimicry, 
Um, here are a few other examples. Uh, and the pun is intended to go across the board to, to take the board on board. <laughs> whenever, uh, whenever conducting major big programs and projects, whenever working on um, the most important um, areas of an organization uh, and developing people, make sure that you have the most senior leaders on board. For example, um, some time ago, we were called by a client because their sales numbers were declining dramatically. And that was a big shock for them because they were the market leader for decades. And seeing their figures go that low was entirely unexpected and troublesome, of course. So the call came from one of the board members and he said, Maria, you know what? We are in trouble. We don't want to admit it, but we need support. And if you are ready to be the scapegoat and help us and give us a chance to, to make some difference, I personally would be very help, uh, very grateful. So we finally ended up having a series of sessions with the board and um, making sure that they synchronize and harmonize their views on the most important matters, how they are going to work together, how they are going to communicate, whether there will be second and third and fourth line of agendas. And initially, it was really a risky experience, to put it mildly, because people didn't want to, to um, open up. Uh, they were just trying to you know, use mimicry and show that they're polite to everyone, but then do whatever they, they think best, although sometimes they would attack their colleagues. Well, after a series of sessions, they finally embraced vulnerability, finally found out that they actually have similar values and um, created what we called afterwards a leadership charter, which defined the ways that they would deal together. And each and every one signed the charter and they signed that they agreed to be held responsible by their colleagues for not observing uh, the charter if this happens. So several months along the road, their financial results stopped falling down and they uh, now are on the up curve. So uh, mimicry goes only uh, a short way and we need to be aware of the, of the emotional triggers of people when we create a, the support environment. Um, and we are now more and more accustomed to hearing about psychological safety. Um, but you know what? Many, many people are actually more talking about psychological safety rather than truly understanding it. Um, Dale Carnegie and Associates conducted a special in, uh, engagement survey to find out more about the factors influencing engagement, influencing the emotional environment, and found out that this is a simple, simple equation of, of two. Uh, main parts and one part are the emotional, uh, the organizational drivers and the relationship with the immediate manager, the belief in senior management purpose and direction of the company being crucial for the success. However, there were two more elements that were added. This is balance with personal life and the quality of working environment. So these two elements came with COVID um, and the, when comparing the previous survey and the new survey, this was the new element plus the emotional element that people trust and believe in organizations which are providing emotional uh, security and, and make them feel confident and, and hopeful and safe. So from, from this perspective, um, here is another good example from a client of ours. Uh, they, they created a whole series of sessions working with their uh, team leaders and young talents to help them feel more self-confident and uh, be able to communicate better and to handle stress and worry and to find and enhance their leadership, to ignite their own leadership skills. And the, you know, one of the main effects was that people started trusting their organization 
again, because this is an organization dealing with um, complex analytics and uh, data science. The level of risk is quite high that these bright youngsters have on their shoulders. And they started kind of cracking down and, and feeling very insecure. So some of them felt that perhaps they, uh, they are not going to deliver on the promise that their organization is taking. So having this emotional support on, on the side of the organization was really saving careers and the sanity of many of the team leaders. Now, talking about um, the next phase, development, uh, here we, we have another series of interesting examples. And one of them is that whenever we work with our people, we really deeply need to know them and to assess them so that we can help, help them discover their own strengths and decide on the areas that they're going to, uh, to work on and also um, help them um, create individual development programs. One, one thing that uh, came from um, several clients' experience, experiences is that when they did the assessment centers, actually in that case, development centers, prior to major development programs, this allowed every person to, to steer their own development and to decide what exactly is important for him or her in that development program. So this enhanced the level of engagement of, of each and every participant. Now, what um, some clients say, especially the ones who are very precise and would like to have everything written down to the very last word, um, is that, um, well, they, they need to have the whole program ready, created 100%. But other clients said, you know what? Let us do the main structure. Let us make sure that we know where we are going, what are the main pillars, what we want to happen, and then we'll see how it goes. And we will leave some room for, for change and for creativity and for adaptation. And in this case, the second type of clients turned out to be much more successful simply because they allowed themselves to, to make changes. While in the case when the client had the program set and crafted 100%, you know, their mind wanted them and pushed them to fulfill everything as planned, despite the fact that some fine tunings were, were possible to be, to be made and to be conducted. Another, another lesson from, um, from our clients is that some of them want entirely standard programs because it gives them safety, the feeling of safety. Others want entirely bespoke programs. And a third group of our clients say, tell us what we should choose. And then we usually tell them, you know what, both. Choose, choose programs that are tested and tried, but also allow flexibility and deep customization. And our piece of advice to you is expect the consultants you work with this approach so that they stand on, on something that is proven that the consultants are well versed with, but also expect them to act on the spot and give what is necessary instead of what is written down in the books and also work on all levels. Usually in organizations, the um, uh, main people that are you trained most are junior managers and mid-management. And this is okay. This is nice. But at the same time, when we have this, those discussions with clients, um, where we should start, uh, should we start with um, first-line leaders, um, our development programs, or uh, shall we address the mid-management first? I usually tell them, you know what? Start from top down, because um, if, if you don't, if you, if you start from a lower level, if not at the end of the first day, then the latest at the end of the second day, there will be at least a few people saying, you know what, this is all very nice, but you should have started with our managers first. However, even this advice is not um, uh, very up to date anymore. And the current advice is work with all levels simultaneously. because. Um, 
senior leadership usually thinks they know it all and they don't have the time for obvious reasons. They are so busy. However, if um, they are not evaluated, if they are not assessed, oh, and this is also a very good time to say that Ames International has a practice in board services, which means that you can rely on Ames to conduct board service to, 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 con to conduct board assessments. Uh, then, if if the board is not um, monitored um, as it should be, then it may deviate in directions that are not particularly favorable. The same goes for the senior leadership. And also pay special attention to mid-management because they're under the biggest pressure nowadays, both from their senior leaders and also from, from the people below them. So work at all levels. The other piece of advice that uh, we have based on um, our practice during the years uh, is uh, related to hiring and uh, to, to, to managing and uh, to, to, to managing the um, organization and, and the talent management practices here. It's, it's very interesting. We, we had a client who said, you know what, we, we have a major problem. 80% um, of our latest hires leave within their first 12 months. That was a shocking number. And they said, we don't know what else to do. We need help. So we went in, we conducted an employee opinion survey. Um, it was particularly detailed because some of their people didn't have access to work computers. So we even had um, a mix of online-based questionnaires, pen and paper questionnaires. We had interviews, we had focus groups, et cetera. So we finally ended up with a detailed report and also with a suggested um, action plan with quick wins, midterm, long-term um, activities that uh, they can undertake. So they were very excited and they started following the plan, especially the quick wins they liked a lot because they could see those the results produced immediately, literally within weeks. But then they, they somehow lost traction. And it is because the um, general manager was changed and this guy hasn't started the whole program. It wasn't his creation, it wasn't his baby. And he didn't follow it uh, with the same level of enthusiasm. So the good results received till that moment finally started fading. And um, at the end, the organization managed to decrease their turnover from 80 to 40%, which, okay, if we are looking at from a per percentage point of view, it's not that bad, 50% lower. But if you look at it in absolute numbers, 40% is still huge turnover. And therefore, our advice is apply a holistic approach. If you, if you start on a long road, and you see the first results, don't think that the whole riddle is solved. Go all the way. And uh, also make sure that uh, uh, you're not skipping big pieces from the process. For example, one of the big pieces would be making sure that your most senior leadership is um, delivering on the promise and is following up on those um, um, good steps that were started. Another lesson from, um, from our clients, this 60 is the new 100. By the way, we are not talking age. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you do understand that. We cannot promise it. Even management consultants cannot promise you to live um, to 100 years and feel as if you're 60. But we're talking something different that we should not expect people to be 100% ready for a certain position in order to be promoted. So um, here related to promotion and succession planning, we are accustomed to, to look for the best at, at this particular moment. But it's so nice, by the way, that we have Nolan on, on the line today because the example that I'm going to give is related to what, he's, uh, uh, what he will talk to you about later on. We, we had a client that asked us to, to assess their sales force. 
because of a sales development program. And we did. And as part of the assessment, we included cognitive tests just to make sure that we have captured all, all the main angles of their people. And in the course of our conversation, they said, you know what, um, we are thinking of promoting this guy to, to be our next sales manager. And when we looked at the results of this guy, um, it turned out that, yes, his sales results are very good, actually the best ones. However, he didn't have, you know, the cognitive horsepower to, to move much further from, um, from what he had already achieved. But there was another guy in their team that was kind of overlooked for the time being because, because he was relatively new. And although his results were good, um, he was so, so new in the organization that, you know, the organization thought we should give the other guy a chance. Um, we, we sat down and had a deep conversation and, and, and we shared our opinion. If, if you're looking for a real sales manager, um, qualities, quality skill set and, and skill set, uh, you should consider the other person because you may end up losing your best sales guy and ending up also with having a mediocre sales director. And th th it was kind of a shock for them initially because they, they had made their decision. They had set their mind on making this promotion. So a few weeks later, they said, yes, we'll, we'll take a leap of faith. <laughs> we'll listen to you. Um, we already monitored and tested this second guy. And he was indeed promoted to be sales manager. And, and it was such a good decision because later on, his uh, results were outstanding. They were just launching a new product. He did so well that his career continued its progression uh, steeply. And um, here, the, the lesson is really deeply know your people. Don't, don't just stay on, on the surface um, and look only at the results, but look in the future. Um, and then another, <laughs> another piece of advice, speaking about promotions and, and hirings, uh, well, remember, keep in mind internal equity, because when, when we hire new people in this crazy market as it is right now, many organizations are pressed to, to give way higher, uh, higher salaries as compared to, to the people that already have, uh, they have on board. So please keep your internal equity in mind because these news travel fast. And although sometimes you cannot change the whole pay structure, um, make sure that you keep the best of, or, of, of your people and try to compensate. It might be bonuses, it might be project-based remuneration or some other ways, but try to compensate this gap that um, might be created because of the expectations of the new hires. And talking about, again, hiring, um, when, when turning to the market, make sure that first you have scouted your internal market and that you know your employees quite well. For example, one of our clients is um, frequently researching not only what the results of the assessments of their people are, but also what their hobbies are, what their interests are, um, what they would like to further develop so that whenever the, the proper opportunity arises, they can offer them um, to take part in an interesting project for them or in a totally new role. So instead of immediately go to the market, I know we are also doing executive search and what I'm telling you is kind of strange, right? Coming from an executive search consultant, but don't always go to the external market. Look at your internal market first and only when you make sure that you don't have the person internally, um, even 60% ready, only then go to the external market. Well, um, moving fast forward, because um, uh, yeah, time, time flies. One, one, one final thing, and it is about the competency model and what we consider to be 
really important to include in those competency models. Of course, professional skills and what we used to call hard skills are crucial for many roles. But you know, in the latest years, um, we have um, seen and we, in action and we have understood the importance of the power skills. Some of them are listed here and others are listed on the next slide. Um, so it makes sense to include those power skills in the current competency models, because in an age of um, unpredictability and, and complexity, in an age which is literally straining human abilities and, and psyche to, to its maximum, we, we need to support our people um, to be not only resilient, because resilience um, is not always that good. Um, and, and I'll tell you why in a little while, um, but to be, to be flexible, to be adaptable, and to make sure that um, we, we come from what is happening right now wiser and, um, and stronger. And why is resilience not always that good? I'll, I'll finish again with obviously now <laughs> clear for everyone, my favorite Nassim Taleb words. Uh, he says, um, anti-fragility is beyond resilience and robustness. And, and he speaks about anti-fragility in relation to Bunny, to the world being brittle. And he says, you know what? This is not so bad as we may tend to think. Um, because anti-fragility is... Uh, um, is actually flexibility. Uh, the resilient people resist shocks. So the, the resilient systems stay the same by resisting shocks. But the anti-fragile systems and, and people, they simply get better. They, they evolve and, and they develop. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and to, to tell you, rely on North Lead and on Ames International in those unprecedented times. And we'll be happy to support you get better and go down the road together with you. Wow, thank you so much, Maria. This was absolutely enlightening and we appreciate sharing your experiences and, and some crucial points to consider within the talent management context with us. Thank you so much again. Um, we, I can see we already started receiving a few questions from our audience and we will share it with you during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, just before we go to our second panelist, uh, I would like to remind you that you can just drop your email address in the chat and our team will contact you to arrange a mutually convenient time for a complimentary 30 minutes advisory session. Our second panelist today is Nolan Bass. And just to remind you, Nolan is the CEO of Circle, a PhD biochemist, neuroscientist, entrepreneur, and innovation advisor. And Nolan studied the cellular mechanisms of cell division within the brain and was able to build wearable technology, measuring brain improvement. We're delighted to have you with us, Nolan, today. And uh, May I uh, start by asking you a question and then the stage is yours. Um, and having seen what Maria uh, presented to us, um, other than the traditional personal assessment methods, what other approaches do you suggest to measure progress achieved through development programs and specifically how it reflects on the human brain performance of our leaders? So again, thank you, Nolan, for joining us. The stage is yours. Yeah, thanks, Yasser, and thanks, Maria. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, that's a big question, Yasser. It's an interesting one. So in terms of trying to understand how the health of an organization is through the health of an organization's brains is, is tricky because traditionally you can measure it through proxy. You can measure it through, um, you know, what are their numbers at work? Um, how fit do they feel? What is their scores on IQ tests or other cognitive tests that you may have run? Um, but there's a part that's missing for that. And the part that's missing is how is their cognitive fitness 
how is their cognitive performance and how is their burnout and brain fog? And you can see with the first slide here that this is something that most people don't realize, but most people from studies I've done in a previous company I ran walk around at about 30% of their best. And so I just put a simple graphic up here to show you what your brain at scale looks like at that size difference. And it's, it's somewhat alarming. And if you're an executive, you're less than that. If you're an entrepreneur, you're less than that. If you're a surgeon, you're way less than that. Because I've measured the cognitive performance and cognitive fatigue of, of all these different people and vocations. And the problem is, is that our brains and our bodies um, are, are very obvious to, to feel, right? If you, if you get wind walking up the stairs, you can feel it. If you are gaining weight, you can see it. There's ways to measure it. Um, the problem with existing at 30% for the broader population or less, depending on who you are, is you have less ability to tap into your executive function. You're more likely to get burnt out and you're more likely to have recurring brain fog. Um, you're certainly less compelling and inspirational as a leader. You're less empathetic. Um, in generally, you're less smart um, and people don't want to be around you and listen to you as much. So it is, in terms of an organization, if you are going back to your question, the answer, if you're mapping the cognitive performance across an organization, you would see really quickly how people's brains would correlate with the health of different departments or parts of an organization, right? If you had one part of an organization where everybody was exhausted, you would see that. Um, or you would see, and initially, this goes back to what Maria was talking about, if you measure the IQ of individuals across the organization, that IQ score or that cognitive test that you ran, which I'm suspecting is IQ, would certainly depend on their cognitive performance based on how well they are managing their brain, right? So if you take somebody who has a new kid or a few new kids, um, like I do, they might get a lot less sleep, right? They, they might not have the time to, to take the self-care necessary. And so their effective IQ when you take the test might be different. And so there's another angle to measuring how well people are performing. It's also how well are they sustaining brain function as they, they work their jobs. Um, one thing that we've seen through the, the evolution of technology throughout our lives is our ability to be productive is just increasing, right? We, I could work 24 hours a day and never, ever catch up because I'm always connected to my team and to the things I need to do and people around the world. And this is for, for the same for everybody. When email first came out, everybody suspected that, well, this is going to be amazing. People won't need to work as much because this email will be so efficient and the complete opposite happened. Now we can work all the time. And now when you go on vacation, you come back and your, your inbox is super full. So this is why we, we are living our lives at 30% of our best brain performance and have no idea, right? And this is based on essentially what's happening. Actually, we can just go back to the, the last slide for a second. I wanna talk a little bit more to those points. Um, the other thing that happens when you're you're living at a, at a lower brain performance is you are more likely to do things that are less good for you. You're more likely to eat less well. You're more likely to engage in capacity to creating behaviors. And what I mean by that is think about going down a rabbit hole of looking at short videos on YouTube or TikTok or something where you're just interested in a small quick dopamine response that requires a tiny little bit of your attention because you don't have enough brain performance to, to really think about something and really learn something that can help actually be capacity improving. The other thing that's surprising here is that if you fatigue an animal to the point where it dies, the mechanism of that death is immune system collapse. And so when I'm talking about brain performance and brain function, I'm not just talking about your brain. There is a circle of influence, hence the name of my company, between your body and your brain. And you have to make sure that you understand how your body is healthy as well as your brain is healthy. Um, never mind feeling less, you know, having less fun in your life, feeling less joy. I mean, these are all things that, that turn it to track from you as a person. Um, next slide, please. So this goes back to my previous point is, well, why do we live like this, right? Why are we allowing productivity um, to, and, and, you know, an unsustainable life to push us into a place where we really are not a healthy best version of ourselves? And why do we feel that this is okay? Well, you feel that this is okay because you have no idea. Right? I suspect that most of you, before I said this last on the previous slide, that you're sitting at around 30% or less, probably thought you were fine. You probably felt normal. And that is because as your cognitive performance slowly lowers, as you get busier and life does what life does, 
you end up just readjusting and being like, well, I'm normal, but I'm a little bit more tired. Well, I'm normal, but you know, maybe I don't have this level of focus that I had when I was younger. Well, I'm normal, but maybe I'm just not quite as motivated as I used to be. And so what happens is your normal is a sliding scale that kind of keeps up with your degrading capacity um, for you know, really cognitive brilliance of being the best part of yourself. And you, have, you don't see it because it happens over time. And it kind of goes back to the, the, the cliche, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And so this is where, where what I do comes in. Um, next slide, please. So the whole point of my company is to allow you to see what was previously invisible to you, right? We can't touch, feel, or, or sense how our brain is performing unless something really terrible has happened. If you get a significant concussion or have some neurodegenerative disease, well, you can remember when you were smarter because, and you can tell there's a difference there. But if it's just a sliding scale of normal, you have no idea. And so what I want to do is help you see what your normal is and then help you improve it. And we do this by using direct brainwave sensing technology. So I don't know if you guys can see this on the small screen, but this is a headset. And this is really a way for you to measure your brain anywhere that you want to get a better sense of how your brain is actually functioning right now. And how as a leader, you might be able to improve your cognitive abilities, um, decrease the um, recurring uh, onset of brain fog and burnout. Uh, next slide, please. So how it works is the, the headset, it pairs with an app and it tracks your brain performance. So typically what you do is you would measure yourself over the course of a week, the same time every single week. And what we would start to pull out of that data is really what, how your brain is changing over time, right? So are you going down? Are you staying flat? Or are you improving, which would be great. Um, but until you measure it, you have no idea. Um, you know, and then the questions we can start to answer is, are, is your sleep actually regenerative? Um, is your weekend actually regenerative? Um, do you need to work a four-day work week this week or a five-day work week this week? It really just depends. How much brain performance do you have that day to really spend on smart things? Um, there's an interesting anecdote I have of when I went down to talk to the Green Bay Packers in Wisconsin, United States, and um, I ended up talking to a surgeon. I measured his brain performance, and he was the lowest measurement I had ever taken. And he was an oncologist, and he was still on call. And so he had to go back to surgery that night. And I said, how can you function? And he said, well, I have five minutes. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, I have five minutes. He says, I sleep in between surgeries. I just put my feet up on my desk and I just fall asleep immediately in my chair. And then I wake up, I eat some sugar and I have five minutes of focus to do the critical things. And then I have to hand it off. That is terrifying. And as leaders, we don't want to be in the same place. I mean, I suspect you're not as tired as he was, but this is something that we need to see to be able to improve it. And so really going back to what we do is all about figuring out where are you at now and how we optimize your path to get back to healthier brain function, to be a better leader, to be more engaging for your employees, and also to make sure that if you do take an IQ test that you score as, be as, as good as you can on it. It was a very interesting anecdote for me. I, I think that's a very, very smart way to look at organizational structure and, and promotion. Um, partly because within my own team, I lead a really highly technical team with a bunch of PhD scientists. And it's always interesting to make sure that I'm not putting somebody in a position that is over their head uh, because I have done that um, and it hasn't worked out. Uh, next slide, please. So how the, how the test measures is you, you have an, an iPhone or a smartphone and it pairs with the device. The device goes on your head. You guys can see this, it just goes on your head like this. And essentially you have these little gold plate electrodes, these spring guys. And what they do is they just touch your scalp and they listen to your brain waves. Just like a, a microphone will listen to your voice, it listens to your brain waves. Um, and then it shows you, how are you changing? Across a day, when are you the smartest? Across a week, how exhausted are you? Are? Across a month, was that a good month or a bad month? Or even year to year, are you declining? Is there some something you need to pay attention to? Is this organization wearing you out or are you winning? Um, and then really what we wanna do is take that change over time and then relate it to what actually improves your brain, changing how you work, changing how you eat, changing when you work. Um, these are all things that are, are more variable now in the remote world that we live in. And so it's interesting to see really as a remote worker running a remote team to varying extents, what can we really do to have as healthy, of a workforce and leaders as possible. 
And so these are all questions that have not been previously been able to answer. And these are the types of things that we're going to be answering at Circle. Um, and the last slide, please. Um, so with, with entrepreneurship, the way I understand it is you start with a problem and you have to find a, a really compelling problem. And the problem is, is that we don't know how well our brains are functioning and it is leading to chronic brain fog population level wide. There are 620 million people across the world that have severe brain fog to the point where they can't get up and shower. We need to fix these people. We also need to go to the other end of the spectrum and look at how we really enhance cognitive ability. Um, that's a whole different talk in terms of really taking us beyond our biological current maximum and finding our superpowers. Um, it is also in what we want to do. But for now, I just want to talk about taking you to your current biological maximum. And we do that by using science that has been around and studied in the last 50 years um, in neuroscience research laboratories. And we're just simply taking exactly what they have understood about this. And we are bringing it to the consumer market. We're bringing it to all of you so that you have a chance to, for the first time ever, see how your brain is working over time. I mean, this is 10,000 research articles published about this. Um, of course, we want to do, as we build a large data set, step beyond the, the neuroscience research literature, but we need to start with the gold standard. And so this is what we're doing. And I'm really excited to, to help any way I can to improve your brain performance and help you understand where you're actually at. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nolan, um, that was really interesting. Uh, you definitely inspired us all on different approaches, how to progress, how the progress can be measured and implemented within leadership development programs. I think we will need to dedicate a full session uh, for this topic. And uh, I think we'll be planning for that very soon. So uh, thank you again. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have received a few questions uh, just for the Q&A session, which will start now. So I'll start by the first question, and it is directed to uh, Maria. Um, it says, how does the current market scenario, like high inflation, looming recession, pose a threat to creating a sustainable talent management ecosystem? That's a big question. It is a big question indeed, because um, these are forces that are going one against the other. On the one hand, we are still in a very tight labor market, uh, which results in very quickly, stampedingly quickly increasing remunerations. And then on the other hand, we have um, this threat from inflation and, and the expected recession. So this on the one hand is a threat, but then on the other hand, it gives possibility for the responsible companies to, to prove to, to their people that uh, uh, they will not be thrown out uh, on the street and uh, they will be taken care of, that the key programs that are working towards their uh, progression and development will still be in place. For example, one of our clients uh, stopped um, a program from for young talents, which was going on for many years, but they stopped it because of a change. And now this doesn't have good repercussions within the organization. So we have to be wise and not try to cut dramatically each and every cost in, uh, in this direction. So uh, what is the threat? The threat is, and, and, and we, see, we have seen what has happened in such situations before. The threat is the salaries go so big that um, they are unsustainable for the organization when situation when the situation changes and when the market crashes. And um, one of uh, one of the companies uh, that we are following decided to change literally change two thirds of the people that they had employed during the expensive times with others who are cheaper and in many, many respects uh, at a very similar level of skills, um, like the ones that they had uh, to let go. So how, how we can create sustainability by being wise, not getting everything that we can, but continuing the programs that are supporting the long-term because this will also pass. 
Thank you so much, uh, Maria. And uh, uh, we have another question for you. I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer uh, all the questions uh, due to the uh, time. However, we still have six minutes left for the Q&A session. Um, it says with holidays approaching, uh, there's a high risk. How can talent management executives build, keep up the momentum for new year? Um, well, at least these are good reasons for, um, for us getting distracting, uh, distracted. And given the current situation, um, it's, it's good that people will be spending more time with their family. You know, I think that from this perspective, the threat is lower as compared to other years because of, because of COVID, because of the way that uh, we showed we can um, work remotely, we can uh, still be productive, uh, even though we are not commuting every single day. So this particular year, I'll be less worried that we might be losing momentum because we show that we can bounce back uh, quickly and work in a different manner. Thank you, Maria. And the next question is for Nolan. Uh, how can the device discern between brain activity and actual performance? Those are not necessarily identical, aren't they? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, so what we measure is your brain activity. We do not measure your functional performance. And so the interesting part with measuring your brain activity and your brain performance is how does that connect to functional performance in all the different ways that you can perform, whether that's flow state with pro sports, whether that's being able to focus, that's being able to relax, emotional regulation, executive function. I mean, there's a lot of different things that we can look at in terms of measuring your brain performance. And the next step is, is in terms of how does that actually turn to your versus my versus somebody else else's functional performance. This link is tenuously established in literature in a number of ways, but the whole point of this technology is to start to build a data set that connects those two things, because that is a perfect question for that reason. We on ultimately don't really know, nobody does. So we have to figure out, you know, if you're measuring somebody's performance in work, and you can correlate that with their job performance, well, there's the first link you can draw. And that's probably the first thing I'd want to do is if I'm looking at a leader or if I'm looking at an employee, how do we measure the metrics of success with their role? And then how do we correlate that in a changing scale with their brain performance? I think it's a fascinating question. Great question. It is indeed a great question and a great answer. Thank you so much, Nolan. Um, I think we will have